Are you struggling with getting good images in low light conditions? Whether you're in the outdoors, photographing nature, weddings, cars, or anything else in challenging light situations, getting well exposed and clean looking shots is one of the hardest things to master. But it's not because your photography sucks, it's the most normal thing to deal with and it's absolutely okay to struggle. As I'm a wildlife photographer, I have to deal with these situations and conditions all the time. With what I've learned over the years, I'm going to teach you the essential things to get sharp and clean looking photos in low light and of course with less noise. <laughs> Let's quickly have a look at the basics. First, we are going to look at the so-called exposure triangle. Part of that triangle is the aperture of your lens, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Balancing these three elements is crucial for achieving the perfect exposure. But before you adjust your settings, the first thing you have to understand is how to work with your available light. That just means how much light is available in your environment that you can capture with your camera. You'll be surprised how big the difference of the available light is depending on the situation. Let me describe my camera and we're going to take a photo of my friend Capo inside my room and then we'll see how much more light is available when photographing outside. So I've stopped down my lens to f4, my ISO will be 200 and now let's see how long the camera has to expose the photo outdoors to get it right. Then we are going to come indoors, take the same photo with the same aperture and the same ISO and see how much time we need to gather the same amount of light in our shot. So as you can see here, the exposure for indoors took half a second and I photographed the well-lit side of the capybara in front of the biggest window. Outdoors it took the camera only 1 30th of a second to expose the capybara right and I was on the side of the capybara with less light. As you can see, Shooting indoors is much more difficult than shooting outdoors when it comes to light. Even areas that look well lit like a gym or a car dealership with big bright lights will be difficult. Try doing fast action photography in a gym. You'll immediately notice it's dark in there. So let's say you're in that situation, just get outside. If you can't, getting next to a window will give you a lot more light. If that still is not enough, You'll have to add some extra lighting like flashes or softbox lights. This of course applies to portraits, weddings and everything that has to be shot inside. Outside, as we could see, is a lot more available light. But in shooting outdoors is some disadvantages too. Absolutely bright sun is usually not good for photography, unless you exactly know what you're doing with your highlights. A wildlife photography shooting in the woods on a dark day, for example, is really, really dark. Here's a photo of a woodpecker that I took with ISO 20,000. What exactly ISO is and how it impacts your image quality will be explained in a minute. But believe me, 20,000 is quite a lot, much more than most people would ever do. But by the end of this video, you will know what to do in order to get these stunning results in these exact horrible conditions, also with high ISOs. In Middle Europe, as we have to go out to photograph animals in the morning or the evening, it's not uncommon that ISOs are this high. Especially when you can't afford f4 or even f2.8 lenses, just like me. And then leads to the first variable of our cameras, and that's the aperture. Aperture refers to the opening in your lens through which light passes to enter the camera. You can control your aperture by opening and closing. With that you can control the amount of light reaching the sensor. It also has an effect on your depth of field, but that's not important, important at the moment. The aperture, or so-called f-stop, represents how big the aperture is. The lens with a smaller number behind the f has a bigger aperture and lets in more light. Let me explain. f2.8, for example, lets in twice as much light as f4. f4 lets in twice as much light as f5.6. And f5.6 lets in twice as much light as f8, and so on. So when you're shooting in very low light situations, use your lenses that have the broadest aperture available. Especially for shooting wildlife, let's say before sunrise and after sunset, where there is really low light, 
You need a certain amount of shutter speed to freeze moving targets, which can be very challenging. The longer your focal length, the less light comes in. The more light a long lens lets in, the more expensive it gets. If you don't need much focal length, there are some really, really good budget options. Let's say you want to photograph people, dogs, cars, or like a lens for an everyday situation. My favorite lens is the 50mm 1.8. It's a perfect solution for that purpose. It's super versatile and it lets in a ton of light. And most brands make this lens for 200 to 300 euros. And for some of them, you can find used ones for only about 100 or 150 euros. That's very, very, very good. Wide F 2.8 is a really good aperture that most people use in their standard lenses like 16 to 35 or 24 to 70. You still sometimes have not enough light, especially when you're doing like wedding photography in a dark wedding location or even astrophotography. In these cases, you, you have to go for something like f1.8 or even lower with f1.4. The amount of light that you gain is huge. For example, when you shoot a 1.4 lens with an ISO of 1600, it would be 6400 on an f2.8 lens. This difference can kill your shooting. The next thing we can control to let in more light is the shutter speed. The slower or let's say the longer the shutter speed, the more light will be captured between the shutter opening and closing again. A common rule is picking your shutter speed by your focal length. So let's say for my 200-600 when I photograph at 600mm, 1 600th of a second would be good. Or for the 50mm I just mentioned, 1 50th of a second would be good. If your subject isn't moving, you can put your camera on a tripod and take as long shutter speeds as you like. A good wildlife example is the owl sitting in a tree. Sometimes they stare for 3 seconds or more. So theoretically you can expose for 3 seconds. But of course with a tripod. If your subject is moving, you have to shorten your shutter speed. You have to have just enough to capture the movement, but let in as much light as possible. Fast moving subjects need even more shutter speed than the one over the focal length rule. But when the line is low, we can't always shoot the highest speed that we'd like to. When I'm shooting flying birds, I shoot with 1 1600th of a second or even more, like 1 2500th of a second. But I can do that only if there is lots of available light. Normally I shoot in manual mode with auto ISO. When my ISO is getting up to 12,800 or more, I'm starting to lower the shutter speed, as that's my personal ISO limit. When I photographed the Eurasian bittern on a dark day with rain some weeks ago, I lowered the shutter speed to 1 1,000th of a second for a flight shot. To my surprise, it worked out absolutely perfect and the photos were sharp. But when it gets even darker and you need to get your shutter speed even lower, your photos might not be sharp. So you need to do whatever you can to try to stabilize your lens, as lowering your shutter speed, especially for action, can only be done to a certain. The lower your shutter speed, the higher the chances to get blurry shots. By putting your lens on the tripod or a monopod, the lower shutter speeds have less chance of making your images blurry. As the chances to get sharp shots are already not ideal, shoot as many photos as you can. If you take 10 photos of one moment, you'll only get 2 or 3 sharp shots, but their quality will be good. The ISO is the amplifier of the light that hits the sensor. It does not affect the amount of light that comes in. Only your opening in the lens, the aperture and the speed or the time of your shutter opening and closing to let light in can control the amount of light. So the ISO just makes up for the lack of light by digitally increasing the brightness of the photo because the combination of aperture and shutter speed aren't able to capture enough. In the end it will be appropriately exposed. Now most of you might have noticed that your images get like grainy or noisy when shooting in low light. But it's not the high ISO that caused the noise. It's just the result of having a low amount of light. What exactly noise is, is explained in other videos better than I ever could. So if you want to understand it technically, check these videos. 
but how can we just avoid or at least reduce noise easily? The size of your sensor can impact how well the camera handles slow light and also noise. In general, full frame cameras handle low light situations way better than crop sensor cameras. That's because full frame camera sensors are larger, which means that more photons can be captured. The ability of capturing more light means that when you raise the ISO, it does not impact the quality of the photo as much than on smaller sensor cameras. That's why people that shoot in low light conditions regularly, such as astrophotographers, shoot with full frame cameras. The last thing I want to mention about high ISOs is that it's fine to have high ISOs. When you're working on a mirrorless camera, especially paired with noise reduction and post-processing, photos with high ISOs higher than 20,000 can be very good. And even DSLRs can make great photos. My first camera, for example, was a Canon 7D Mark I. You could see the noise clearly at about ISO 800 already, but it was fine. I took photos with that camera with ISOs of 6400, and I can remember one photo that I took with ISO 12800 that turned out great in the end. As I just mentioned noise reduction, let's talk about that and post-processing in general. And guys, I can tell the abilities nowadays are incredible. For example, my grandfather is a nature photographer for about 40 years now. Last year, I did some noise, redu noise reduction with him and the photos were all made with 5D Mark III's and also with 7D Mark II's. He could not believe what he was seeing. Today he tells me all the time that he learned photography in a whole new way and he's not afraid of pushing the ISOs anymore because of noise reduction possibilities. Of course, the less noise the better, but we'll now look into shots that have a lot of noise and we'll see what we can do with editing. First off, in low light you always want to shoot in RAW as you get the most dynamic range and the most ability to process the photo. I will now switch to Lightroom, but that's not that important. I think other software has had the ability to reduce noise too. Later, we'll jump into special noise reduction software and you will be stunned by how incredibly good that works. So as we are already here, I have another tip. Sometimes you have really dark parts in your photos. Just let them be dark and work with them in your images without making them brighter. Don't try to rise shatters or anything too much that will just expose more noise. Now, to reduce noise, we first have to look into our shot. The first thing you want to find out is where, where the majority of noise is located. Normally, it's most noticeable in smoother parts, just as the background. And that's also where we can find it here. Now we have two options. We can reduce noise in the whole picture or we can reduce it just in the background as the subject actually looks quite good. Before we try both of the methods, I have to mention that we try to reduce most of the noise, but also want to keep as much detail as possible. So to reduce the noise all over the shot, we just go to the main editing area here and scroll until we are in the details area. There is the button with noise reduction. By clicking that, this window pops up and we also get a close-up preview of an area with noise reduction, like how it would look like. As Lightroom tries to preserve details by itself, we just have to move the slider until we found that sweet spot of low noise and high detail. That's it. Now when you only want to reduce noise in your background, as your subject might look good, you have to go to this area to create a mask of your background. You can either do it by directly letting Lightroom do the work, but you will get much more precise outcome when you help a little bit. What I do is just work with the object selection tool. I draw it all over the subject and the AI selects the subject quite precisely. If it's not absolutely accurate, I can fix the meta areas by adding or subtracting with the object tool again, or even more precise with the brush. As we want to create a mask of the background and not our subject, we can just invert it and here we have our background. Now make sure that you're still in the mask area and go to the details area again. 
So just to display, we go to an edge where we can see foreign background and by clicking on the photo and activating and deactivating the applied noise reduction, we can see that it not affected our subject. That's absolutely amazing. Let's do this whole procedure in a software that is made for noise reduction really quick. We're in Topaz now and I just want to show you how much of a difference this software makes. This is a shot with a lot of noise in it. It's ISO 25600. Then we just play around a bit and here we go. I think I don't have to say anything about that. It's just wow. As you can see, the work that AI software does nowadays increases the quality of your shots so much and I'm absolutely thankful for that. The last and probably the easiest tip to handle high noise images is just don't crop. Cropping makes your photos so much worse when it comes to noise. Really try to use a composition where your subject is small in the frame to not expose all the noise even more. And that was it. I hope you could learn something and you can prove your no light photography at the next time. Let me know if I missed something and see you next time.